All right, we've been in a series entitled Shake Off, Shake It Off, Shake It Off. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, the good, the bad, the indifference, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We talked about shaking off the offenses. We talked about shaking off the failures. We talked about shaking off the what-ifs. We talked about shaking off the indifference. Today, I want to briefly talk to you about shaking off the wins. Because sometimes, when God shows his faithfulness, sometimes when you start seeing the goodness of God, you have a tendency to sit down and just stop. And you think there's no more. We can look at all those slideshows. We can look at everything that God's done. We can listen to amazing testimonies from all those who got baptized and, and what God is doing. And we can think that's it. Church, we've arrived. No, we have not. Not individually and definitely not as a church. There is so much more that God wants to do. So I want to very briefly open up by talking about someone you know in the Bible, which is David. And there's a passage of scripture in uh, 1 Samuel. I'll, I'll jump there real quick. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And this is where, you know, David is coming to bring his brother's food. And, and Goliath has, you know, made lines against the Israelites. And they're all fra afraid and they're trembling. And he's like, I'll do it. I'll fight the fight. What's wrong with all you guys? All you wussy men who aren't willing to go fight? Come on. I, I'm a, just a kid. I'll go do it, right? And and here's what it says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 36. It says, Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has defiled the armies of the living God. So here is David as a young boy who was in a rhythm and a routine of going from win to win and victory to victory with God. He, he didn't want to be known as the, uh, the bear killer. He didn't want to be known as the lion killer. He didn't care about being known as the giant killer. He just wanted to be known as a follower of God. And he didn't choose to set up camp at any one of those victories. He literally defeats Goliath, gets the king's daughter as his wife, gets the prize, right? Gets the accolades, and what does he do? He keeps serving God. He keeps going forward. God, what's the next thing that you have for me? And, and God starts using him in a mighty and a powerful way to start defeating all their, their enemies. And it actually says this in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 12 through 14. It says, Saul, who was king at the time, was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but he had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. And everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. So here's what's going on. Saul has stopped walking out in obedience to God. So he doesn't sense God's presence. God's, God's hand is not on his life anymore. But David, he's moving on. He's moving on to the next thing that God has for him. He's believing that there's more. And the people start singing as they start, you know, having all these victories. They start singing, well, Saul's killed his thousands, but David, his tens of thousands. And they're, they're looking at, at David and his life, and they're energized by what God is continually doing. Nowhere in there does David choose to set up camp and say, this is it. This is all that God has for me. And so God keeps doing amazing things in his life. He eventually becomes king of Judah and then eventually king over all of Israel, over all the tribes, by the ripe young age of 30. And so what does he do? He keeps fighting wars. He keeps doing what God has called him to do. Until one day, we see in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men. David suddenly got comfortable. I've done so much. I fought so many battles. 
God, I have done so much for you. I just want to sit and enjoy. I'm the king. I got this giant palace. I, you know, I got the girl. I got all of it. I just want to sit and enjoy. I want to stop. And you guys know the story. That's what opened the door for sin is when he stopped. When he stopped pressing on. When he tried to camp out right there. Like this is, this is it. I've arrived. I tell you, until Jesus returns, we have not arrived. There is work that he wants to do in your life and through your life. There is work that he wants to do in New Life Church and through New Life Church. And I do not want to get complacent. I do not want to stop. I am so thankful and I'm grateful. But actually, when I, when I look at those pictures, when I look at what God's done, when I see the testimonies of people, when I look at the finances, it stirs my faith that God can do more. And that's what it should do. Victories and the wins we get in life, big or small, they should stir our faith to believe that God's got more. There's more that he wants to do. And we're not supposed to just settle in. And I think, you know, when you look at the Christian life as a whole, I just want to read you a couple of verses real quick. 2 Peter 3.18. It says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So there should be progress. There should be growth. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the full armor of God. So that means, we're, why? We're, we're in spiritual warfare. There's victories we're supposed to be fighting. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way as to get the prize. We're in a race. Nowhere in here is there parking, sitting. We talked last week about idleness. Well, idleness is one thing, but just being satisfied with what God has done and feeling like you've done enough, that's just wrong. That's just wrong, and it's going to open the door for the enemy in your life. God wants to do more. 1 Peter 2.11, it says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. So we're pilgrims, so there's... This movement, we don't stop. We're thankful for what God's done, but we believe he's got more. So when people ask me, well, Pastor Danny, what's your vision? What's your vision for the church this year? More souls. More disciples. More people. Let's do it. Do you realize how many tens of thousands of people right here in Billings are going to hell? Do you realize how many hundreds of thousands of people are right here? in Montana, are going to hell? Do you realize how many millions of people in this country, how many millions are, are around the world are going to hell? We have a job to do. God's not finished. He's moving. Here's what it says in Hebrews 10.38. It says, my righteous one will live by faith. I want to stop there. You live by faith when you are believing God to get you somewhere. When you think you've arrived and this is it, you don't need faith. I've got my house. I've got my memories. I've done what I need to do. This is where I'm at. And you built your own little kingdom and God's going, hello, my kingdom, not yours. I've got more to do. So keep believing. Keep stepping out by faith. And he says, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. So imagine, if you would for a second, if, if this is me, and imagine if God is right here with me. And God keeps moving, and I'm like, I'm good. God, I, I've done a lot for you. I've given a lot of money, given a lot of time. It was a good year. God, I gave you a lot. Well, next thing you know, God's over here because he's doing stuff, right? That's, that's how you shrink back, is you stay where you're at, I don't want to stay where we're at. I, I want to keep growing. I, I, want to, I want to keep seeing what it is that God has for us. You know, we, we do have a lot of people who, who come here and they're like, well, we like New Life because it's a, kind of like a smaller church. We, we like the community. Well, that's wonderful, but don't be selfish. We want to keep making room for people. And if it gets too big, then we'll plant another church in Billings or we'll plant another church somewhere else. We don't have to be this big, huge campus, but God wants souls. So we can't be so selfish that we, we like what it is. No, you can't come. Wait, we got too many. Wait. I don't want to share my friends. I don't want to share my time. I don't want to share. I like it. Well, we were invited in. You were invited in. So why would you be so selfish as to not invite other people in? 
That's what it's all about. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. So we've, we, we've got we've to keep going. We, we don't want to stop. There's room for more growth. There's more people we can share the love of Jesus with. There's more we can do with our gifts and our talents and our resources and our connections and our friends to, to grow the kingdom of God. There's more that we can do. That's why Galatians 6, 9 says, man, don't become weary in doing good. Keep doing it. <laughs> keep doing it. There's so much more that God's got, so keep moving on. Be thankful for the victories. Be thankful for the victories. But move on. Let it build your faith to believe that God can do even greater things. I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. This is Paul, and this is the statement that he makes. And this is what I love about Paul. He's got this figured out. He really does. He says, though I am free and I belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. He's going, guess what? I have purpose. I know what my purpose is. I've got to reach people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To win the Jews, to those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those who don't have the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I become all things to all people, so that by all possible means... I might save some. Do you understand his, his passion and his zeal? He's not saying, I know if I do all this, everybody I preach to is going to get saved. He's going, I'm going to do everything I can to everyone. It doesn't matter if they're Jews or Gentiles, males or females, rich, poor, kid, old, young, sick. It's irrelevant. He's going, they're people. I'm called to people. And I'm going to do whatever I can to connect with people in hopes that I can win some. You know, if you're, if you're going to go fishing in the natural and you cast your line out there one time, the odds of catching, catching a fish is pretty slim. I mean, I know some people, yeah, every time they do, but it's not me, <laughs> right? But the more you cast, the more you fish, the better chance there is of catching a fish. So at some point, we've got to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep putting myself out there. God, I know there's people you want me to reach. I know there's more. So what does this look like? Well, it looks like a cute little Dr. Pepper can. <laughs> I stopped drinking coffee. This was my coffee replacement, right? So this is just enough to give you a taste and to satisfy that little bit of a hunger. And some people are like, that, that's it, that's perfect, that's all I want, I, I, I don't want more, I, I just like this. Why would we settle for this when there's more? There's so much more that God wants to do. Look at that. This is like what we would call normal, right? This is the just enough portion. This is the, you know, I'm going to sit down with my pizza and my tacos. Not at the same time, but, you know, two different meals. It goes good with really both, with both, right? And that's the perfect amount. Or as my wife would say, this is like the share one. She doesn't drink pop. I do. So she can drink it. So, you know, this is perfect for my wife and I, right? And, and we settle in. And we're like, okay, God, this is perfect. This is just enough. I can handle this. I like this. But yet, do you understand that there's more? But that's, that, that's a good step. You know, 43 years, we've had good, steady growth at the church. I like that. That's a good step, all right? You know, you, you, you're taking a step. You, you can handle a little more. But come on. There's more. <laughs> and now, this is literally the share size, if, if you're in our family, you know, because it's, it, it is almost too much for you. So it's good. So we, we want to keep growing and building to the point where we understand it's not just about us. It's not just about what we like or what we can handle or what we're comfortable with. It's like, God, I want to expand personally, and I want to expand as a church so we can accommodate more and be more of a blessing to more people. And some people are like, okay, well, I, I can handle a middle-of-the-road size church. Well, come on. 
God's always got more. And I know some of you are like, oh my goodness, I can't even believe they make those. You know what I mean? Like, no, that's not the kind of church that I want to be. That's like too much. That's obnoxious. You know, my, my wife would walk around with this, shake it, spray it. I, <laughs> she loves the more. She loves the big. She loves the lots. But why can't we believe God for this? Why can't we take the steps? And did you know that you can buy those cans and six packs? 12 packs, 24 packs, 36 packs. Like it's endless how much you can get and the quantity. So why do we limit God? We, we don't limit it for our flesh. We, we, we don't limit God in how much, you know, uh, we think uh, he can bless us with food or other things that we really want or like. But yet, if you look at Paul, he's like, hey, wait a minute. I've got this purpose that's bigger than me and it's people. And I'm excited. And I'm not just thinking about myself. I'm not just making sure that I have enough for me. I get my little, you know, my little sip, my little taste. I'm just going to go to church on Sunday and get my little, uh, okay, I'm good, you know, for the week. No. No. I want to bring my wife along. I want her to enjoy some too. I want the whole family. I mean, I, can, I got enough for everybody, right? Like that's, that's how we're supposed to be living our life where it's like it, we're not so self-focused. We are believing that God has people he wants to reach. So here's the first thing I see from Paul here, is we've got to stay passionate. We absolutely have to be passionate about what we do. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his kingdom. God wants people in his kingdom. If we're seeking his kingdom first, then our passion is going to be people. Our passion is going to be sharing the gospel. Our passion is going to be making sure that everybody we know comes to a saving knowledge of him. We literally just had somebody stop by our house last night that my wife's been praying for their family for years, ever since we moved into our neighborhood. And she found out when that girl came into our house, she goes, I, I don't remember how she said it, but basically she said, I want you to know. I've given my life to the Lord. I found Jesus. And she goes, and I know you guys have been praying for our family. She goes, keep praying. I'm the only Christian in my family. Keep praying for my family. See, that's powerful. That's what it's about. It's about reaching souls. It's about touching lives. It's about saying, God, who, what, where, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to, to reach? We've got to have this zeal. and We've got to have this passion. And if I ask most of you, what are you passionate about? Very few Christians would say, soul winning. That's what we're called to do. It's not a personality thing. You don't have a soul winning personality. You, you have a drive from the core of you that you are loved. And because you know you're loved and you've experienced that love, you want to share that with other people. Some people can take a crowd of 50. Some people can only take one. Take the one. Take your opportunity. Reach people with what you have, but you got to stay passionate. Second of all, you got to keep connecting with people. That's what Paul was saying. You know, to the Jews, I became like a Jew. In other words, he's just trying to find a way to connect. He's trying to find common ground in a way that he can share the love of God with people. At work, there's a way to connect with people. Do you realize that most people, wherever they work, that's usually where they build their community because they don't have community outside of work because sometimes they work 50, 60 hours a week. So why not build some community with your coworkers? Look for an open door to sow some seed, to encourage them. What about your neighborhood? What about, you know, where you go to school? Wherever God places you, use it as an opportunity. But you've got to keep connecting with people. The worst thing you can do is to be satisfied with the relationships you currently have. I'm just telling you right now, if you are just content, I've got, you know, my best friend and then my second best friend and my third best friend and we got this couple and we get together. Actually, there's two of us couples and, and we get together all the time. Like, great, have friends, have good friends. There's, that's, not, that's not wrong. But the second you don't open your heart and your, and, and your life up to other people, you've, you're going to stop sharing the gospel. That's how you do it. Is you develop relationship. It's not just standing on a street corner yelling at people. 
It's talking. It's connecting. So you've got to stay connected with people. Acts 1.8, you receive power. What? To be a witness. You receive power so, so you can get everything you want and you can be free. and you, Yeah, 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 whatever. Be a witness. Why don't, why don't we talk about that enough? Your life is supposed to be a witness. You're called to people. Wherever you're at, look for people. Look for opportunities. Share the love of God with people. Romans 10, 14 and 15 says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And that, how can they hear unless somebody preaches to them? Unless somebody says hello to them? Unless somebody says, how are you doing? Unless somebody says, what's going on in your world today? Unless somebody says, can I give you a hand? Unless somebody says, hey, I'd like to buy you dinner. Unless somebody says, hey, would you like to go for coffee? Did you get the concept? How can they hear unless somebody shares the love of God with them? That's what we're called to do. Somebody agreed with me on that one, right? And then here's the third thing. You've got to be adaptable. You've got to be adaptable. In other words, <laughs> Paul discovered that his life isn't always going to work out the way he thinks it's going to work out. Here, I, I, I want to look at this. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. It says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila. And uh, it, it goes on, and, and he's ha hanging out with them. And he says, and be, and he was a tent maker, and he stayed, and he worked with them. And then every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade the Jews and Greeks. So here's Paul, and, and he had all these ideas and things of what he was supposed to do. And for some reason, God planted him here for about two years. And in those two years, he would go in the early morning, and he would go in the evening to the synagogues, and he would preach the gospel. He would preach the truth of who Jesus was. And during the day, he would work. And he would make tents. He, he wasn't being funded to do it, so he found a way to fund, and this is how I like to put it, he found a way to fund his addiction of sharing Jesus. We fund every addiction that, that you know, we have. So it's time we get an addiction to sharing Jesus, and we'll find a way to fund it. And if you look at church history, it's recorded that in those two years, Paul reached upwards and made upwards of 150,000 converts. Two years. Not, it wasn't his plan. He made some adjustments. I guess I got to work right now. I'm going to work, going to build some tents. But early in the morning, I'm going to preach the gospel. Late at night, I'm going to preach the gospel. And I guarantee you, in the heat of the day, he was preaching the gospel too. That's what he did. He adapted. He didn't let any season or any circumstance stop him from sharing the love of God with people. That's what we've got to do. That's what we're called to do individually and as a church. James chapter 4, verses 13 and 15. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we're going to go and do this or that city. We're going to spend a year there, carry on business, make some money. <laughs> Why is that always a part of our motivating factor? Come on. I'm going to go here or there, spread a little Jesus, right? See, he says, well, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this or we will do that. In other words, the simple principle is this. God, I have a plan and you have a plan. I submit my plan to your plan and I'm going to adapt. But I know that a part of your plan is using my life to reach people. Whether it's one or whether it's 150,000, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. And as a church and as individuals, we have got to get that purpose and that passion ignited inside of us. That's, that, that's the beauty of being part of the family of God. Is we were invited in. And God desires that everyone will come to a saving knowledge of him. So why are we not extending the invitation? I mean, even Paul's like, hey, I know I'm going to get rejected. <laughs> I know not everyone's going to receive what I have. But I'm going to keep offering. I'm going to keep extending. I'm going to keep doing everything I know to share the love of God with people. And I believe that some are going to accept. And you know, when you see some, someone 
accept, it just suddenly makes everything worthwhile. Seeing some of these guys get baptized today. See some of the ones that got baptized at early service. Just, just makes this, this whole year worthwhile. All the heart, all the work, all the effort. Life's changed. God, it was worth it. Hearts changed. But most importantly, eternities changed. So what's my vision? My vision as a church is that we would do whatever it takes to keep reaching people. That we would always have an eternity mindset. That we would always put people before anything else. And that we would make our lives about sharing the love of God. Let's stand up in this place today. I really believe that if we would shake off even all of the blessings. Do you realize that sometimes the blessings that God gives us stop us? And they hold us back? You know, we're like, we're so thankful. Man, my kid finally got saved, or my coworker finally got saved, or I finally got that job, or I finally got this. And, and, then, and then we just stop. And we stop right there. God's going, hello, I got more. I got more battles. I got more to do. I got more victories. And they keep getting bigger. You look at David's life, they just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, the bear, the lion, the Goliath. Yeah, let's just start doing armies after armies after armies. Let's just, you know, not just lead you to, let's just take, let's put you in charge of all of this. There's more. But we just can't stop. And we can't limit God. So if you're in this place today and you're like, okay, I, I really want to move on in what God has for me. I believe there's more. And I want to be ready and I want to be available. I just want you to raise your hands. I, I, I just, I love to do that because it's just like a sign of surrender. And God, in this place today, we're just surrendering our hearts, our lives, our dreams God, even the great things that you've done in and through New Life Church, God, we surrender. We give it back to you. And God, we believe that there's more that you want to do. And so, Father, I pray that you would just stir in our hearts, stir in our lives a passion for you, which will create a passion for the lost. God, I pray that we would stop being so self-focused that we, we don't see the harvest that's ripe around us. God, use your people and God, use your church to build your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, Father. You might be saying, what, is it, what does it look like to give yourself away? Well, you know, in first service, there was a couple a gentleman came out to me. They were actually just back in town taking care of some things. They live, they've moved way down south. And he said, it's not where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be here, plugging in and serving and doing something for God here. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go down and we're going to take care of things. And we want to be obedient to God. We want to serve and be a part of the body where we're supposed to be. So they're going to go take care of some stuff and move back. I don't know what it is that God's speaking to you. But I guarantee you, it's bigger than you. And if you think of it the way Paul thinks of it, you'd see being used by God as the greatest blessing ever. That, that's how we put it. The blessing. The blessing of seeing people come into the kingdom. The blessing of being used by God. I'd like some of our prayer team to come up. If you're in this place and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, come up and, and talk to one of them. They'd love to introduce you to them. Or maybe you're in this place and you're like, man, I just don't know what to do with this. Or uh, I'm, I'm a little shy, I'm a little timid. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to walk alongside you. And we don't just want to do life with you. We want to do ministry with you. We want to reach people with you. That's the greatest thing that we could ever do together is make those memories of growing the kingdom. You can eat with anybody. You can play a game with anybody. But man, 
if you, you know, when you start connecting with people to reach souls, there's a connection that happens that's powerful. So, Father, I just pray over your people today. God, as they've made a commitment, I just pray that you would rise up on the inside of them right now, that you would empower them, God, that you would just break off any fear or worry or, or pride or selfishness. And, God, that you would open doors of opportunity to let your love flow through them to others. God, when they open their mouths, give them the words to speak. And, God, I pray that they would sow so much seed that lives would be touched and changed. In Jesus' name, amen.